I mentioned to you that tomorrow Tracy will be ordering a new software program that contains every song in our hymn book. It's only recently become available through 21st Century Christian or we've just only recently been aware of it. It's not terribly expensive and uh, should be of high quality, so we'll look forward to getting that and uh, having that available in the not too distant future. It's good to see all of you this evening. If you've noticed, it's already darker than uh, we are accustomed to, and that's not going to get any better for quite a while now. The days are getting shorter, and uh, we will be moving to daylight, or the elimination of daylight saving time, I guess I should say, early in November. And that means that we'll essentially be going to work in the dark and coming home in the dark. And the same will be true of our worship. So if you are driving and have trouble seeing at night and you need some assistance, uh, we'll do our best to help if you'll let us uh, know of that find someone that uh, perhaps can assist you in getting here, uh, just call the office and we'll relay that uh, to the appropriate parties. I want to share with you some things this evening uh, from the prophets. The prophetic literature of the Old Testament is extremely enlightening. If you've ever doubted the inspiration of Scripture or the deity of Christ, my personal conviction is that a careful study of prophecy will allay all those doubts. It is beyond the pale of human ability to know the future. We simply can't know what tomorrow holds let alone what a hundred or five hundred or a thousand years from now our world will be like. And certainly if we have any sense at all, uh, we will not be making predictions. That's out of uh, the realm of our ability. But at the same time, I would remind you that the God we worship and serve is not limited as we are. And as is so often mentioned from the pen of Isaiah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knows the end from the beginning. And thus you find passages like John 5, 39, where Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life, and they are they which testify of me. And of course, when I read that passage, my mind immediately jumps back to Isaiah 53, which is undeniably a description of the crucifixion of Christ. It is vivid, it is graphic, it is on target, and was written approximately seven centuries before his arrival. Do you have any idea what's going to happen 700 years from now? I don't, and neither does anyone else. But God knows the future as surely as he knows the past. And in the prophetic literature, there are many, many predictions of the coming Messiah, Jesus, as we said last Sunday, quoting John the Immerser, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In Acts 18, we're introduced to Apollos, a convert to Christianity, a man who was eloquent and showed publicly by the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, and in particular, I would suggest to you the prophetic literature, that Jesus was the Christ. In Romans 15, verse 4, a passage that we often cite, Paul wrote, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And that's a clear reference to not anything from Matthew to Revelation because that New Testament book had not been completed when Paul wrote his letter to the Romans. The scripture he had reference to is what we commonly refer to as the Old Testament. It has tremendous value, great insights, and of course part of the value of it 
not exclusively, but certainly a part, is the predictive nature of prophecy, in particular as it relates to Christ and his death. Then we have Peter writing in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not of old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we have a reaffirmation of the inspiration of the Old Testament and acknowledge that the prophets were able to see the future not because of personal insights they possessed, but because they were guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. Now I said all of that because of the passage that was read a moment ago from uh, Matthew chapter 11. It highlights the life and ministry of John the Immerser. In Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verse 4, Mark observes that all Judea and Jerusalem went out into the wilderness. They went to hear, to see, and to be baptized by John. He was an extremely effective prophet and preacher of the Word of God. And in fact, if you were following carefully, what Jesus said in Matthew 11 about him, he was the greatest prophet born among women. You list all the prophets that are mentioned in Scripture, oral and literary. That's men like Elijah and Elisha, as well as Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and the others. And Jesus says, and John, the immerser, is really above all of them. And then he says something really remarkable. He that is least in the kingdom is greater than John. John lived and died and was never a Christian. And he never really, in the fullest sense, knew what all of us now know and possess as people of God. He could look ahead and see the role that Jesus would fulfill and what he would accomplish but he died before Jesus was crucified. He lived, therefore, and died under the law of Moses. He didn't fully experience this side of the grave, the grace that is given to all of us through the sacrifice of our Lord. And when Jesus made reference to John, he asked, when you went out into the wilderness, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a reed shaken in the wind? Did you go out to see a man dressed in soft raiment? Not at all. John was not that kind of man. He had a rough exterior. He didn't, we would say, perhaps present his best foot forward from the human perspective. He wore rough clothing ate a diet of locusts, that's grasshoppers in our modern vernacular, not the locust, the 17-year locust that we're familiar with, but ordinary grasshoppers and wild honey. Those were the staples of his diet. But he was still the greatest prophet. He took his stand for what he knew to be true and was unbending. In essence... He's held up as an example for us to follow in our relationship with God and in our stand for truth. Not the picture of success that the world would paint, but from God's perspective, a truly successful man. I want to share with you a quotation at this time. This is included in a prayer by Douglas MacArthur for his son, and it reads as follows, and I had to write it down because I simply didn't have the time nor the desire to memorize it. MacArthur prayed, Build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he is weak and brave enough to face himself when he is afraid, one who will be proud and unbending in honest defeat and humble and gentle in victory. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goal will be high, a son who will master himself before he seeks to master other men, 
one who will learn to laugh yet never forget how to weep, one who will reach into the future yet never forget the past. And after all these things are his, add, I pray, enough of a sense of humor so that he may always be serious yet never take himself too seriously. Give him humility so that he may always remember the simplicity of true greatness, the open mind of true wisdom, and the meekness of true strength. Then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. I have to tell you, I don't have a clue as to whether or not MacArthur raised a son like that. I seriously doubt that to be the case. But what I can tell you is, Zacharias and Elizabeth raised such a son. His name was John. And he was a faithful servant of God throughout his short life. He knew his place. He knew his purpose. And he fulfilled in every sense what God expected of him. It was, after all, John who said of Jesus, He must increase, I must decrease. You know, I think of that often as I get older. The time will come when someone else will fill this pulpit. I don't know when that will be. Don't have a clue. Have no plans beyond tomorrow. But what I do know is that someday someone else, God willing and time continuing, will hold this spot. And he is the one that you must look to. He is the one that will give you instruction from God's word. And he needs to increase and I need to back away. That's just common sense. It's the way it is designed to be when you're wise enough to see that. And I pray that I will be wise enough to recognize there comes a time when someone needs to fade away and another needs to come into the spotlight, so to speak. John saw that in relationship to Jesus and was so effective in laying the groundwork for the coming Messiah and Jesus' ministry and the success of that ministry described, for instance, in John chapter 4 where it said that Jesus and his disciples made and baptized more than did John was only possible because of the work that John had done. He knew his place and he also knew his purpose and he courageously presented God's message. And what did it cost him, as you well know? His life. He had the courage of his conviction, took his stand for what is true and right, and would not compromise divine principle. Would to God that all of us as Christians would be like John and stand for what we know to be right, no matter the cost. Now, I I said all of that in order to share with you some things that I just feel need to be said on a regular basis. So I've got nothing new. I never come here with anything new, to be frank with you. Sometimes I may say say the same thing in slightly different language, but... The message remains unchanged. And when I think of the prophets, there are three things that come to my mind over and over and over again. And so I'm going to highlight them for you quickly tonight, and the lesson will be yours. The first comes from the the life and the call of Isaiah to the prophetic ministry. I'm not going to read the passage. If you'd like to read it as I speak, that would be fine. I simply want to highlight what God said and how Isaiah responded. God raised the question during this man's call to the prophetic office, whom shall I send? In essence, I have a job that needs to be done. Who will do it? Who can I dispatch to answer the call of duty. Our typical response is, get someone else. 
Isn't that human nature? But Isaiah's response was, Here am I, Lord. Send me. God has called all of us to do our duty. And if we learn from the prophets the kind of lessons we ought to learn, in my judgment, first and foremost is the need to hear the call of God and do our duty. You know who Uncle Sam is. He was a great recruiting tool, especially during World War II. And men and women responded in great numbers to do their duty, to answer the call, and I never want to minimize their sacrifice. I want to honor that and all who serve this great nation. And I appreciate men like Todd who remember our service men and women in their public prayers as all of us need to do in public and in private. And yet at the same time, I would submit to you there is even a greater duty that all of us need to rise and meet. And of course, when you think of duty, as a Bible student, there are two passages that inevitably come to mind. The first in Ecclesiastes 12, the 13th and 14th verses, where the summation of that great book is, Fear God, that is, honor and revere Him. Keep His commandments, for this is the whole or the whole duty of man. And why is this so important? God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. He knows. He truly knows whether we are doing our duty or not. The call has been made, and all of us have answered, not everyone, as did Isaiah, here am I, Lord, send me. But I said there are two passages. The second is in the Gospel of Luke, the 17th chapter, in a parable of our Lord in which he talked about a servant who works all day in the field for his master. That usually meant a 12-hour day. It would begin around 6 in the morning and conclude around 6 in the evening. The servant labored all day, came in that evening, prepared his master's meal, served his master, met every obligation and responsibility that the servant had toward his master, and only when all of those responsibilities had been met could the servant himself eat? And the Lord raises the question, does the man have reason to boast, to be proud? And responds, no, because he has only done his duty. When we serve God, we have no reason to be proud or arrogant because it's our duty. We have a responsibility to our Creator and our Savior, and He is calling. In the ministry of our Lord, Jesus said, The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray you, therefore, that the Lord of harvest will send reapers into the vineyard. How do we answer that prayer? By seeing our role and doing our duty, by living our faith every day, and by sharing it with the people around us. We must keep our commitment to Christ and do our duty even when failure seems a certainty. If you read the full context, of Isaiah 6. Isaiah asks, Lord, how long am I to do this? And to put it very clearly, as long as there are cities, as long as there are people, as long as there are souls to be taught and saved, but know that few will respond to your message. Isaiah did not make a lot of converts in the course of his prophetic work. But he was one of God's most successful prophets because he did his duty and remained faithful to his commitment 
to the end of his life. And tradition says that he was actually martyred, sawn asunder for his faith in God. The second passage comes from Jeremiah 20. And I, how many times have I mentioned this to you? If you say 100 and I live another 5 or 10 years, you could probably say 200. It is just that important because in our environment, we have a lot in common with the prophet Jeremiah. Here's another prophet who is as faithful to God in preaching God's word as he could possibly be. He's saying to the people, Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And they're saying, No, we don't want to hear God's word. Jeremiah is telling them, God is going to inflict judgment upon you. He will use the Babylonians. Don't resist. This is directly tied to our failure to be faithful. You will spend 70 years in bondage. And it cannot be stopped. But that is not what the people wanted to hear. And so they tried to silence him on many occasions. His life was constantly in jeopardy. One time they threw him into a dry cistern, leaving him for dead. When his prophetic writings came to the king, they were read in the king's presence, and as a section was read, it was ripped up and thrown in the fire, as though that would destroy the validity of the prophet's message. But it gives you some insight into the kind of life he lived, and he acknowledges that everybody mocks me. When you say today that you believe in the creation narrative of Genesis, that God did it, and he did it in the fashion the Bible reveals, people mock you. Well, that can't possibly be. All the evidence demonstrates that our world is 14 and a half billion years old. Look at the fossil record. That record doesn't say that our world is 14 and a half billion years old. It says that the Bible's true. That the universal flood of Genesis 6 through 9 actually occurred. And the fossil record is proof of the validity of the biblical narrative. Quite honestly, there is nothing that supports the notion of organic evolution as a viable explanation for origin. But you stand up for truth and right, and you will be mocked. You accept the story of the universal flood, and you will be ridiculed. You may be like Jeremiah on occasion, in derision, daily. And you may become so discouraged that you just say, done. You ever tried to teach someone and the harder you worked, the less progress you made until you just gave up? Well, that can happen to a prophet like Jeremiah. So I'm done, he said. I'm not going to make mention of him anymore. But as the text says, Jeremiah came to realize that God's word was in his heart. It was shut up in his heart and he was weary with forbearing, that is, being silent. He discovered that he just couldn't be quiet. Truth is truth, and it must be proclaimed. Even when you are surrounded by the enemy, when everyone mocks you, when life is hard and difficult, God's word still has the answer to men's greatest needs. And God's servant will continue to preach it. They never, never, never give up. You remember the address that Winston Churchill gave on October the 29th, 1941? And if you've been following the news, you may have learned just recently that this man is not that great a figure in history. Someone quoted him recently and was ridiculed. Were it not for this man, there is a high probability that a lot more folks would be speaking German today. He almost alone stood against the Nazi 
advance, saying we will fight them on the sea, in the land, the beaches, everywhere. We will never, never, never surrender. And so in the address at this school, the most famous quotation is this, never give in. Never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never get it, give in except to conviction of honor and good sense. May I submit to you that that's exactly what you'll learn from Jeremiah about your relationship with God. I understand discouragement. I realize that living for Christ puts us in a position where people are going to be critical. In fact, they're looking for an excuse to criticize. But that should not keep us from doing our, doing our duty like Jeremiah. We should never, never, never give up. One final bit of prophecy. This man is not as well known as Isaiah or Jeremiah, but his message is just as powerful. It's in the days of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Ahab, for those of you who may not know, is king of the northern kingdom of Israel. In the days of Solomon, when Solomon died, the kingdom fell to his son Rehoboam, but Rehoboam was not uh, leadership material, frankly. And early in his reign, the kingdom divided. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was appointed king of the northern kingdom, ten tribes called Israel. Rehoboam remained king of Judah over two tribes. And there is constant friction between the two nations throughout uh, the history of both. The northern kingdom finally succumbed to the Assyrians in 722 B.C. and the Babylonians defeated the, the southern kingdom of Judah in 586 B.C. But in the days of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, they shared a common enemy in Syria, the same Syria that's in the news uh, much even today, where Assad is the current leader, and they're engaged in a civil war, and they've used chemicals against their own people and a whole host of things. The same geography... The Syrians are a threat to both Israel and Judah, so the two kings come together with a desire to form an alliance and take on a common enemy. Ahab, as you know, is married to Jezebel, and he's not exactly a stellar character. Jehoshaphat, on the other hand, is a reasonably good king, and when Ahab suggests to Jehoshaphat that they unite their forces and take on their common enemy, Jehoshaphat wants to know, are there prophets of God available that we might know the will of God? And Ahab said, yes, I've got 400, in fact. And to a man, they said, unite your forces, enter into battle, and victory is assured. That was not satisfied. Is there another prophet? And there was one. His name was Micaiah. It is of him, Ahab said, I hate him. I've known people who've hated preachers, not because they lived immoral lives, not because they taught false doctrine, but because they stood for truth. And those folks did everything within their power to undermine the ministry of that preacher. Well, that's Ahab in relationship to Micaiah. I hate him. Why? He never tells me what I want to hear. And Jehoshaphat said, I'd like to hear from that man. So Micaiah is sent for, and the servant dispatched to bring the prophet before the kings is told. The 400 prophets of Ahab have predicted success, have urged that they join forces and enter into battle. You should say the same thing. But Micaiah's response was, what the Lord saith. That will I say. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. All that matters is what God says. Isn't that still true? 
think of all those areas today where the majority of people say one thing, but God's word says something altogether different. Where do you stand, with the majority or with God? Micaiah says, stand with God even if you stand alone. What the Lord say, says, that we must say. Isn't that what Nathan did when he stood before David and told the story of a, a wealthy man and his poor neighbor? The wealthy man had vast herds and flocks. The poor man had a single lamb that he loved like a daughter. It slept in his lap. It ate from his bowl. That turns my stomach because I'm not an animal lover unless they're fried properly. But a lot of you are, and you can probably relate. The rich man received a guest. And rather than take from his vast estate his large herds and flocks, he took his neighbor's pet lamb, slew it, and fed it to a guest. Now, what do you think somebody like that deserves? Seriously, what do you think? Wouldn't you respond like David? He ought to restore fourfold and pay with his life. And Nathan looked at David and said, you're that man. Now kings had it within their power to give orders and those orders were carried out. You know the story, he ordered the death of Uriah the Hittite, a soldier in his own army who served faithfully to cover up his adultery and the illegitimate child conceived in the adulterous relationship. Nathan could have lost his life, but he would have lost a lot more had he been silent. Go back to John the Immerser who Jesus commended in our text to introduce our study tonight. He looked at Herod and Herodias and simply said, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now he had to know what kind of response that would elicit from this couple. And he knew the power that kings have. He knew he was putting his life on the line. But there are just some things that are that important. He was going to stand for what was right, regardless of the cost. And for him, that meant his head. In Acts 7, Stephen addressed the multitudes. And what does he do? He retells the story of their history re leading up to the crucifixion of Christ and lays the blame for the death of the Savior at their feet. And for it, they stoned him to death. Even our Lord acknowledged that sometimes when you stand for what is right, you stand alone. He warned his disciples that they would all forsake him, that he would be alone, and yet said, I'm not alone, for the Father is with me. I like this statement from James A. Garfield. He said, if there's one thing up on earth, that mankind loves and admires better than another. It is a brave man, a man who will dare look the devil in the face and tell him he is the devil. That's really what Micaiah did. He looked at Ahab and said, if you go into battle, you do so at your own peril. This is not God's will. Success will not be yours. You will pay with your life. Now, he began by repeating what the prophets had said, but it's clear he did it in such a way that Ahab knew immediately that he wasn't being honest. He demanded, tell me the truth. And Micaiah, without hesitation, took the position that he took, knowing that 400 prophets stood in opposition to him. But he stood with God. Paul closed the letter to the church at Ephesus with a similar warning. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God that you may able that you may be able to stand. That's what we are called to do. That's the lesson that the prophets teach. That's what we see in Matthew 11 with John the Immerser, a man who took his stand and stood tall and firm. He was not the reed blowing in the wind, but a man of conviction, a man of integrity, a man of God. And yes, we're all called to follow that example, to follow the example of the prophets we've mentioned and to live our life so that when duty calls, we answer the call. And when persecution arises and we feel abandoned, we will never, never, never give up. We will stand for what is true and right if we stand alone. John did. Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Micaiah did. So must we. And if you're taking that stand as a Christian, I can promise you that it will not always be easy. But I can also assure you, you'll never regret it. But if you compromise, if you surrender, if you give in to the world and to the masses, that will forever haunt you. Let's learn from the prophets, follow their example, and follow God faithfully, and he will bless us in wonderful ways. If you're not a Christian, we close tonight with an invitation from our Lord. We'll sing the song, and it's an opportunity for any in our assembly who are not prepared for eternity to get right with God. We will gladly take your confession of faith from a penitent heart and immerse you for the remission of your sins. You will be buried in a watery grave and raised to walk in newness of life, but know that it's a hard life, a difficult life, but one that we can live, succeed, and ultimately be crowned victors, but only if we heed the lessons that pervade God's holy word. If you're subject to this call, won't you come as we stand and sing? Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace? that comes by giving all. Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see was best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find a place of constant rest? Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Please be seated.
Thank you, Roger, for that message. Thank you, Dennis and Todd and everyone else who took part in making the worship service happen this evening. Roger just mentioned that Paul Jacoby's not feeling well today. Kathy Dye had surgery and is recovering at home. Lonnie Love, Bethany Brown's grandfather, was in the hospital and is now with his son in Caldwell. Marge Stacy was in the hospital. She's now at Harmer Place. Junior Nolan and Mary Wharton were in the hospital and are now at home. Ruth Rake is now at Hannah's house. We extend our deepest sympathy to the family of Linda Jones, Judy's sister. Memorial services will be held at a later date. If you are willing to rent a room to a female Ohio Valley University student, please let the office know. We will have a holiday meal on Sunday, December 2nd after our morning worship service. The service project of Coats for Needy Children has begun. To participate, you can purchase a new heavyweight winter coat, youth size, small, medium, or large. Or if you prefer, you can make a monetary donation. Please have your contribution submitted by November 7th so that we have time to complete purchases, organize, and deliver to the schools on November 17th. Bess McConnell's son-in-law passed away in Tennessee, and also her brother passed away last evening in Arkansas, so please keep that family in your prayers. Communion has been prepared. If you did not have the opportunity to partake in that this morning, during the singing of the next song, just exit out the back and go around to the conference room, and that's ready for you. We will have one final song, and then Kurt Harrison will lead our minds in a closing prayer. <laughs> 